Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar, uh, The State of the Mobile Web Development. We're going to talk about a useful overview of the mobile web technologies of 2020. Uh, we're going to go through our experiences, through uh, all of the technologies that we worked on in the past, and give you some insights um, regarding our experience. Great, first things first. Let's talk about some introduction. So first, who are we? My name is Alex. Uh, I have been a software developer for the past four years. Uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I had my four year anniversary. So happy birthday to me. Uh, I've been working mostly on the uh, web technologies ecosystem, mostly on the front end part, but I've dabbled a bit with the back end as well in Node.js uh, and Java and uh, just a little bit in .NET. So I, I, let's say I'm like sort of a uh, Swiss Army knife. Um, one of my passions and one of the things that I do most in my free time is playing video games. Uh, I just bought recently in my pandemic uh, times uh, a gaming chair for this, so it's easier for me to relax and enjoy this. Uh, my favorite franchise is Assassin's Creed, so if uh, I, there are any fans uh, in the public, we can talk about this later all day long. Uh, and one of uh, my artistic, let's say, uh, hobbies uh, is music. I like the music theory quite a lot. Uh, I also know how to play the guitar and also the ukulele. Um, and by the way, I've uh, just as a fun fact, I've dabbled a bit with music theory in my dissertation paper. So computer science with music theory equals love. That was pretty cool. Uh, what about you, Alex? Hello, everybody. I'm the second Alex for the day. I'll be co-hosting, so I'm just mostly uh, doing a support role. Yeah, well, I'm also a programmer, mostly JavaScript. Every, actually, everything JavaScript. That's what I like to do. And as a, a, a second passion is uh, psychology. I actually started my second faculty this year. I'm going to go see how that, that plays out. And I also like music, but I play the flute, not the guitar. Picked it up recently. Really cool. Okay, so let's continue. Great. Now that we've passed introductions, let's go straight into the more serious part of this webinar. Our journey begins in 2008. Uh, this is the landmark year, the year where all of the cell phones that we knew uh, transitions into what we call today smartphones. It's the year where uh, Apple and, uh, and Google introduced what we know today as iOS and uh, Android for uh, the major platforms for our mobile phones. Um, Pre-2008, so before this, uh, this year, um, people used to have a bit of weird behavior using the cell phones. They had a lot of charms, which you don't really see today. Uh, some stickers which lighted up when everybody called them. Uh, keyboards on their phones like this, Blackberries everywhere, uh, and flip phones. I'm pretty sure these images uh, are relatable for some of you. I know three at least uh, are relatable to me, um, but everything was surrounded uh, with Symbian. Symbian was the major uh, operating system on the phones back then. Back then. Uh, it's what we call the dark times. Uh, we don't go there. We, our journey begins only in 2008. So um, we're gonna talk about eight technologies um, that we, we had experience with. And beginning in chronological order, uh, first of all, uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the native uh, technologies. One little side note, if you have questions, I forgot to tell you earlier, but if you have questions, please use the Q&A uh, functionality in Zoom. It's, it's, it's down there for you. Ask any questions and we will answer them uh, at the end of this webinar. Right, moving on. So the native technologies, uh, basically for iOS and Android. Uh, for each of the eight technologies that we're going to talk about in this webinar, we're going to cover four criteria in the beginning. So technologies, code base, deliverables, and the uh, developer uh, developers needed in order to have an application with these technologies. Uh, for the native ones, so iOS and Android, they are backed up by big companies. They're backed up by Apple and by Google, respectively. As technologies, you will have uh, Objective-C and Swift for the iOS ecosystem and Kotlin with Java for uh, Android. These are the most famous ones. Uh, the code base, you will need 
one code base for the iOS devices and one for Android. Uh, therefore, you will have some native files uh, as deliverables. And of course, in order to have an application uh, working on both of the uh, native platforms, you will need two professionals, one for each platform. Now that we have this covered, it's time for a fun fact. Did you know, in 2004, uh, the Android was supposed to be an operating system meant for digital cameras. Uh, actually, Andy Chalkin uh, pitched his idea of having an operating system, a smart operating system for digital cameras in which you can send the pictures on the cloud and in which you can share really easy with your, with your friends and stuff like that. Uh, since the digital market, comp uh, market went down in that period and the mobile devices market went up in that period, he decided to switch. And that's how we got Android on our phones today. On the iOS part, one fact, in 2007, when Steve Jobs first announced the iPhone, the, the first iteration of smartphone, um, he mentioned that third-party applications will not be uh, built using an SDK. They will be built using web technologies with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript with Ajax calls. Uh, basically, he was thinking about PWAs back in 2007, which was pretty cool for that time. After a backlash from some developers and uh, after some, uh, some decisions from uh, really high investors, he decided to, well, we're just gonna go 180 degrees on this one and we're gonna have an SDK. And in 2008, he first announced the first edition of uh, the iOS SDK. Pretty sad, but that was the life. Great, uh, for each and any, every one of the technologies I'm gonna talk about, we will analyze uh, the key points. Uh, in particular, we have the SWOT analysis. So what does the native, uh, native uh, uh, technologies have as a strength? Um, it's really obvious, it's really fast, it's mature, this is the oldest, it's the pioneer that started everything. So of course, you're gonna have a really uh, fast performance, it's gonna be speedy, uh, you have access to all the hardware, um, and you have great device compatibility. But for the weakness, in order to obtain all this, uh, this performance, you have, will have a higher cost. So uh, of course you will have a higher employee cost, a higher maintenance cost, because you will have distributed code base. So you will have a code base uh, for iOS and one for Android. It's double uh, the effort if, uh, if you put it on paper, in theory. Uh, for the opportunities, since it's been up since 2008, it has a really great community, uh, great tutorials and stuff. Uh, and whenever there's a new OS update, they're the first to have access to it, which is pretty great. Um, one threat that I, I could think about was the fact that uh, some manufacturers actually tried to um, uh, augment the uh, uh, fun functions in, uh, in the OS. So it's gonna be a bit weird when some manufacturers have different implementations of uh, some features. I, I can think about, let's say, uh, biometry and, uh, and uh, login using the uh, fingerprint and stuff. Uh, some manufacturers try to have their flavor in there. And sometimes it won't work unless you have some uh, workarounds. So it's really uncertain on, on the manufacturer's part. And since you have two distributed code base, you, you cannot expect for your developers to have a, a synchronized uh, speed when you, when you build an application using both of these. So, Native applications are high performance for a bit of a higher cost, let's say. Moving on, in 2009, uh, Cordova built up something really cool, uh, something that we, we, we used a lot in the past using uh, other frameworks like Ionic, let's say. But Cordova was the bridge that made possible to have application using uh, web technologies and uh, have hybrid applications. Uh, Cordova is backed up by the community. It's not backed up by a big company like uh, uh, Android and iOS. Uh, it's, um, it's part of the Apache uh, software organization and it's an open source one. So it's backed up by all of the developers that uh, contribute to this one. Uh, it works using JavaScript, any kind of flavor you want, but it's mostly JavaScript. Um, and what's cool about it is that you can do cross-platform stuff using one code base. So you have one single code base and you can have mobile applications and web applications and also desktop applications, which is pretty cool. For this, you will have the expected deliverables. So except for the native file, you also have some web bundles. And 
In order to have this work, you need one professional, in theory. But in practice, it's it's an ish right there, because you will also have you will encounter later on 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 the way. Or at least that's what we did. We encountered some uh, issues with plugins and inconsistencies that we'll talk about a bit later. About them. did you know, um, Cordova is actually the open source uh, version of Adobe PhoneGap. So PhoneGap started uh, this, uh, this journey and uh, Cordova said, okay, let's try to make it open source. Let's try to, uh, uh, it's a really cool concept and we're gonna try and have the community uh, build this together instead of being uh, proprietary from Adobe, which was a good call. Uh, right now, uh, Adobe PhoneGap has been dropped and it's part of uh, the internal uh, code in Cordova. So it was a good, good decision on uh, Apache's side. Uh, if you are to analyze Cordova, starting from the strengths, it's one of the surviving ones. So even though PhoneGap was the first one to introduce the, the hybrid bridge, uh, Cordova is the surviving one. It's still in the market right now. Um, it has a lot of angles covered using different plugins. Uh, and setting up a Cordova project and starting a new application from scratch it's really, really fast. It's way faster than you would do with native applications from our experience. Uh, for weaknesses, as I mentioned earlier, with the ish part, it has some nasty issues with plugins. And from our experience, we there, there were some plugins that were meant to work only on one platform, but they didn't really care much, didn't care about uh, having the other platform support as well. And we also have an ex example on this one because one of our colleagues, they like uh, all sprints, so two weeks, trying to fix inconsistencies from, uh, from the lacking parts of the other platform that he worked on. So you, you might encounter some of the nasty issues. Uh, it's made by the community and backed, up, backed by the community. So it, it's, really, it's really large. It has a great community and the documentation is great it's also on plugins. Uh, the threat is that it's not backed up by a company, it's backed up by the community, uh, which in, in its own rights has some, has some threats in the future. There's no stability. Uh, don't know about the future of this one. Also, Ionic is migrating actually in favor of Capacitor, which is something that we're gonna talk about later in the webinar. Uh, and that Adobe has run phone gap. So basically the future of, of, of Cordova is a bit unstable, so we don't know about this one. Uh, next one, in the timeline, we have Ionic. So four years after Cordova, Ionic saw the light of the day. Uh, it started working with uh, UI frameworks as well. So it start, it's, it, first it started working with AngularJS and Angular 1 that we know back in the day. And it was a really great hit because of that. Uh, it's backed up by Driftico, which is not such a big company, but it's still an Australian company. Uh, it's, uh, it worked a lot on this one, so props to them. Uh, as I mentioned, it started with Angular, but later on in the years, they also had a support for React, and uh, this year they had support for Vue.js. So the three largest uh, uh, UI frameworks are covered in this one, which is great. Uh, it's cross-platform, but for the desktop one, you will need the support of Electron. Electron being another framework uh, used to uh, de develop and build uh, applications for the desktop. Uh, platforms. You have the expected deliverables and you will need one proficient JavaScript developer in order to have this uh, working fine. Uh, fun fact on Ionic. As I mentioned earlier, Ionic is backed up by Driftico, but if you look it up on the internet, if you look Driftico on the internet, you won't find that much information about them except for the generic company data that you would expect from a company. Uh, actually, they're trying to make their image, they're trying to make it Ionic. So they're, they're putting Ionic in front of it. Uh, and they even announced it on Twitter back in 2015 that they're moving all the company news, all the information over to the Ionic framework. So they're relying a lot on the, on the success of Ionic. Uh, let's switch it up a bit. So first of all, we're gonna talk about the weaknesses on this one. Uh, the major weakness is that it's mostly community driven. So just like Cordova, uh, most of the issues you will find them in plugins that, that have not been developed so great. Just like I mentioned in the example in Cordova. Uh, for the strength, it's one of the oldest uh, hybrid mobile frameworks. 
it's fast as the other one. And they also added an enterprise feature uh, uh, early, earlier uh, this uh, year, which is good because you have more support for this. Uh, but also that's also a threat because it might become more enterprise in the future. So who knows about the free part of this. And since it's made, it, it's wor it works using Angular, React, and Vue, if you know Angular, React, or Vue, you already know Nightfield of Ionic. So a developer which knows this, these languages is going to do really great using Ionic. Uh, okay, the major competitor for Ionic uh, appeared in 2015 uh, in a hackathon made by Facebook. Uh, it's called React Native and it's backed by Facebook, obviously. It's using React. These are a lot of atoms in the page. Uh, React Native uses React, obviously. Uh, and it has mostly support for mobile. Therefore, there is mostly support for the deliverables in the mobile uh, ecosystem. Uh, but you can also have unofficial support for web applications and for desktop applications, but using, using workaround, using plugins. There's no official support on this one. And you will need a really great uh, JavaScript developer working on this one or a React proficient uh, developer working on this one. Um, I'm just gonna show you these two logos. And I know you're probably not gonna be able to answer it right now in my face, but if you're gonna see a difference on this one, please tell me because I really don't. I mean, it's confusing, Facebook. Yeah, they have the same logo, which is a bit confusing in my opinion. Um, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly for this framework. Uh, the good being that it's the best of the both worlds between native and hybrid. So it works a bit more uh, performant than a hybrid application, but it's not as native as a native application. So it's somewhere in the middle. Um, it's backed by a big company. And as I mentioned, if a React developer is trying to work on this one, he's going to know 95% of the uh, framework. Good community, good documentation. For the bad parts, uh, it lacks some in-house basic features that you expect from a modern web framework like routing. It doesn't have push notifications. And also the component list made by Facebook is pretty small uh, in comparison to the other one. So mostly are community driven. Uh, the ugliest part is that even though it grew in popularity and it's really great, um, it also has some detractors. So in 2018, Airbnb actually dropped React Native. Uh, they, they made their application using React Native and they just dropped it because, uh, because performance reasons. Uh, and also if you want to have some platform specific modules, some, some really deep down uh, uh, hardware specific uh, um, features in your application, you might need some native developers to work on a, a native code. Okay, we're halfway through. Uh, going further in time, uh, a couple of months actually, uh, in 2015, the PWA, Progressive Web Apps, were announced by, uh, by Google developers, a couple of Google developers in, in an interview. Um, I'm just gonna make a little mention here because it actually was fully supported in 2018 because Safari decided to support the main uh, technology behind PWA, service workers. They decided to support it three years later. Uh, but for the sake of this timeline, we're gonna keep it when it was first announced and supported by 75% of the browsers in 2015. Um, PWA is uh, a bit different. It's actually a web application, fully web application with some uh, concepts behind it. It's backed up by Google uh, and it uses JavaScript. Uh, as any web application, you can use whatever you want, but JavaScript is the core of it. Uh, you can use uh, PWAs to deploy your application and have it on mobile, web, and desktop, but it's going to be a web bundle in the end, so we don't have native applications. It's just a web application in a web view. And you'll need a pretty skilled uh, JavaScript developer to have this uh, work. Um, did you know, uh, probably there's a really high chance that one of your favorite applications on your mobile phone right now is actually a PWA. Uh, they added support for uh, deploying your PWA inside the stores, the app stores and the Play Store, respectively, uh, last year. And you can also find a couple of applications there, which you probably don't really know if they're native, but I'm going to tell you they're PWAs. Uh, Twitter Lite, Instagram Lite, and Google Maps Go, is, uh, they are three big examples of PWAs that you can find in the store right now. So if you're using them, 
congrats you're using a, a progressive web app and you didn't even know. Um, for the SWOT analysis, uh, so what does PWA bring to the table? Uh, so as I mentioned, it's not entirely dependent on the store, even though you can have applications made on the store. Uh, the main uh, way of um, adding your application is through the browser, you will see a little pop-up on the bottom of your screen, which says, hey, you want to add this application in your home screen? And that's when you know, that's when you know that you have a PWA uh, working on your phone at the moment. Um, it has offline capabilities, which is pretty great for a web application. It's basically a website, uh, an application hosted on a website that can work offline. That's pretty cool. And since it doesn't really, it's not a native application, it, it's really small in size. So if you, if you want to take it from the browser, if you want to take it from the home store, you will notice that the size is a bit smaller than, uh, than a native uh, one. Being a web application, you will have to take care of the security management a bit more carefully because you will have another, another uh, tier of security vulnerabilities that you have to take care of, like cross-site scripting or SQL injections or anything that the web is vulnerable at. Of course, the security is managed by the developers, so they, it's their responsibility, but you will have to be a bit more careful on this one. And applications that you save from the browser are not in your drawer as you're used to. They will only stay in the home screen. For the opportunities, it can be developed with any JavaScript framework, so that's pretty cool. It's great sim for simple application, and for now, the trend seems to be in favor of them. So we'll see what happens in the future. Um, uh, as a threat, it's part of the user experience. So the users might not be really familiar with adding applications uh, from the browser directly. They expect to go on the store and that's why they added support for uh, adding applications in the store in last year. Uh, next one is, uh, is Flutter. Flutter appeared in 2017. It was first announced in 2017, but the first stable release was in 2018. It's a bit more different. It's not, not exactly a web application, but it's not exactly a native one as well. It's somewhere in the middle. Uh, it uses, it's backed up by Google. Sorry, I didn't mention that. It's backed up by Google uh, and it uses Dart as the main language. Dart is also a language made by Google, developed by Google, uh, which is a bit different, as I mentioned. It's not entirely object oriented, even though it is object oriented. It's, it's a bit more declarative. It, it's something else, but it works really fine. Uh, of course, you can use uh, the native technologies as well for this. You can use Objective C and Swift uh, for the iOS. You can use Kotlin and Java for the uh, Android code if you want to go a bit more specific in the, in the platform. But it's mostly Dart. Uh, you have one code base for all the platforms. Uh, you have support for all the platform, which is pretty cool. And you will need a proficient uh, a developer in Flutter, which is pretty rare, or a couple developers which are uh, a bit new in this one because it's it's a bit more different. Uh, fun fact: so even though Google develops Android and is taking care of Android as a platform, they started experimenting with a new operating system for the phones and for the desktops as well, which is called Fuxia. Uh, I think this, this appeared in 2018, and it was a bit a, a big shock for for the mobile uh, community because it's a different operating system for the mobile. Uh, and the cool part is that uh, the UI for this one is made using Flutter. Even so, if you're developing an application right now in Flutter and you add some specific code from Flutter. Um, you will add a couple of features and a couple of UI stuff from Fuxia as well uh, in your code base that you can use if you want, which is pretty cool. Uh, for the SWOT on this one, so uh, Flutter offers you some native-like experience on all platforms, but just with one code base and it's pretty cool. Uh, the hot reload is like really, really hot. I worked with it. I tried the hot reload. I tried Flutter. I was really impressed by having the application reload on my face in one second after I saved, it's pretty, pretty fast, I like that one. Um, for the weaknesses, I think it's still not mature enough. Uh, it's pretty new, it, it, it was stable in 2018, so it's still pretty new. Uh, it's a bit hard to customize the UI. Um, we're used to having markup languages, we're used to having HTMLs on the web, uh, the XMLs on Android, and the storyboards for iOS, uh, but 
Flutter uses um, class hierarchy and it's a bit more complicated. It uses widgets. You you can look it up uh, if you if you want to see what I what I mean. But it's a bit hard to customize the UI from our experience. And of course, the documentation is pretty scarce since since it's new. Uh, you won't find many things uh, if you if you bump into issues and stuff on the internet. Uh, as an opportunity, if and if it's big, if if Fuxia OS uh, ends up being something really big and you know Flutter, you're in luck because it will use Flutter. Uh, but for the threads, um, it's pretty difficult to find professionals uh, which are experienced in Flutter. Um, it's pretty new and people didn't really uh, go into it as they expected probably. You will find a couple of them on the market. Uh, I know just one person in, in real life, but still they're pretty rare. And since it's made by, by Google, of course they, will, they have an Android bias. So maybe in the future, who knows if they will support iOS that much. I, we hope it, it, that's, that's the case, but who knows. For now they have a bias towards Android. Last but not least uh, is Capacitor. And Capacitor is actually an alternative to Cordova. It's built from Cordova. And it's backed up by Driftico, the same company that uh, is behind Ionic. Uh, you will need most of the stuff that you would need for Cordova of JavaScript, uh, any flavor. Uh, you have support for uh, mobile and web platforms. Uh, but you don't have support for desktop at the moment, from uh, from what we uh, what we experienced. <clears throat> so that's a minus, and you will need one skilled developer for having this uh, application in place. Um, I mentioned earlier, as a fun fact, uh, that it's based on Cordova. It's actually for for Cordova, and it tries to learn from the mistakes that they did. Um, and since Ionic is trying to migrate from Cordova, probably in the future it's going to die. So let's say that Capacitor is the spiritual successor from, uh, from Cordova. So the king is the ally of the king in the future. Let's talk about the pros and cons. So what does Capacitor uh, come with? What does it put on the table? Um, it has backwards compatibility with Cordova since it's made from Cordova. Uh, you have a fewer plugin issues that you will expect from Cordova, and that's because there's a smaller list I'm going to talk about in the cons part. Uh, it learned from the mistakes of, of Cordova and React Native. Uh, the future is looking really great. There's a new release announced already. It's really easy to migrate uh, Cordova the capacitor. Uh, it can be integrated really seamlessly in existing native projects. Uh, and it has a large community, which pre seem pretty eager to transfer to transition to Cordova uh, to Capacitor. I'm sorry, um, which is pretty great. So the future is looking great. Uh, for the cons, the technology is pretty immature at the moment. So um, it's pretty new. Uh, it will need to mature, and until it matures, you will might need to use some Cordova plugins. So you might end up using the same, having the same issues that you wanted to avoid in the first place. And as I mentioned in the pros with the fewer plugin issues, that's because you have a small plugin list at the moment. It's still being developed, but it looks really promising. Okay, uh, now that we went through all of this, let's make a small recap. So we have these eight, eight, uh, seven, seven, my bad. We have the seven technologies in front of us, and we have five important criteria that we, we uh, think that are really, really, uh, uh, important. So what's the effort of developing a basic application fast, uh, the performance and the access to advanced hardware, uh, having offline capabilities, uh, having a high security in place, and the stability of the framework or the technology. So we'll, we'll go through all of them. Um, for the native applications, Obviously, it excels in the performance part, it excels in the security part and stability and the offline capabilities, but it's a bit more difficult to start a new application from scratch and just develop uh, an application really, really fast. Um, uh, basically, when you want to use native technologies, you have to think about your uh, application. And if it's performance heavy, if it's security heavy, if you use some really advanced hardware like sensors and whatnot, you might want to consider uh, native applications. And of course, you won't have, if you don't have 
uh, really, really, really uh, tight deadline. You, you can go for that. Uh, Cordova is going really well on the offline capabilities and the security part. It's a bit not okay in the stability since Ionic tries to, to migrate from it. So who knows what, what the futures uh, will put on table for Cordova. And since you might encounter a bit of uh, inconsistencies with the plugins, probably the effort is, is something to, to take care of. Um, and of course, being a hybrid, the performance and the access to hardware isn't really, really, really great. But if you want to have something that can be easily customizable, if you want to do it pretty fast, then you can go for Cordova. But we suggest to also uh, pair it up with another framework. Like for example, Ionic. Um, Ionic is really fast to set up. You uh, develop an application with Ionic really fast. You can use a framework that you want that you your developer lo developers love, which is pretty great. It's it's really great on the other aspects except for the performance. Uh, Ionic is known not to be one of the most performant uh, uh, frameworks out there. Uh, but if you want as well, if you want to, as I mentioned in Cordova, if you want to have an application that um, can be easily customizable, you have a really tight deadline and your uh, people already know uh, web technologies and JavaScript and whatnot, you can go for Ionic, it's a pretty great option. Uh, React Native, it's pretty similar. Uh, it's a bit more performance than Ionic, so you can go for a bit more performance stuff using React Native. Um, but it has a bit of lacking features when it comes to advanced hardware. And since Airbnb uh, dropped it and it has detractors, um, we don't know about the, st the stability of this one, so who knows. It's a great alternative to Ionic if your developer knows React and it's proficient with React, you can go for that one. Uh, PWAs are really fun. They, they seem to have the trend in their favor. So that's pretty great. Uh, but it doesn't, as an application, it doesn't have access to lower level hardware. It doesn't ha have access to uh, sensors and whatnot. Uh, the security is a bit more uh, harder to take care of, even though it's not impossible. Uh, and the offline, even though it works offline, you have to take care of what you, your users use. So if your users have old phones uh, which don't support service workers, then it's a bit uh, something to take in consideration. Uh, what would you use PV PWAs for, in my opinion, would be something really simple, uh, applications that make use of basic APIs like uh, maps and geolocation, stuff like that. It's pretty, pretty cool. Something that goes really fast, that's the way to go. Um, Flutter is great, in my opinion. We worked a bit with Flutter, we loved it. It's uh, a bit more difficult to start it from, from the scratch. And it has a, a bigger learning curve, in my opinion. So if you don't have uh, such a tight deadline, and but if you have a more a tighter deadline than you would have for native applications, um, Flutter is a great, it's a great alternative. It's really fast, it's performant, it's just one code base, pretty great. Uh, and capacitor, um, I would say for any application that you would uh, use Cordova for or Ionic or whatever, you can start using uh, capacitor as well. So if you already have an application that uses uh, Cordova, you might want to consider migrating to capacitor. Or if you're starting a new application from scratch, which uses web technologies, it's like, you would want something easier to customize and that uh, it's consistent on more platforms and whatnot, Capacitor might be a good solution in our opinion. All right, uh, now that we passed through all of these, um, it's time to go for some Q and A's. This is the Q and A part. Uh, right now we have two questions from, from what I saw. Um, so first one from Simon Valentin, how easy are the deployment of cross platform applications going on store iOS Android? 
how easy is the deployment of the cross-platform applications. Um, oh, it's a poll. So it's pretty much the same. Um, uh, you will also, you will need um, uh, access to Xcode for iOS, for example, and um, an Android Studio for uh, signing your application if you want to deploy it on the store. Uh, if you have access to both of these, then you will have to go to the uh, uh, um, through the guidelines that both uh, the stores have. So they will go through the code review part and they will try to um, see exactly uh, if your application complies. And afterwards, if this period passes and uh, whatnot, you will have application deployed. Having it cross-platform is going to be deployed in both of the stores. Uh, the second one. We are looking for a direct private store B2C for a future application. Do you know one? Um, maybe Alex can give some. I can, uh, well, I can yeah. pick that one up. Um, so practically you do have a private store in uh, Apple Business Manager or Google Play. They both, uh, they both offer private apps. But if you're looking for a custom solution, we don't really have experience with any of them, but I do know about Appaloosa, for example, which is practically a private store that you can use to distribute your applications to different clients or uh, um, whichever you would want to. So you, you could go with custom solution or you could go with uh, what uh, Apple and Google offer. I hope that answers the question. Great. Uh, more questions one. coming in. Yeah, we have two more questions. Uh, coming from uh, Xander Gabriels, what would you pick for developing a new application? Uh, I think we can both answer this one, Alex, maybe from our both uh, perspectives. Uh, if I would pick something for developing an application, first of all, I will see the requirements for the application. So it really depends on what you're trying to achieve with the application. If it requires something really heavy on, on uh, uh, hardware stuff, you can go for something that's a bit more uh, native. So you can either go for native, native technologies like iOS, Android, Flutter. But if you don't really mind about having access to extremely hardcore hardware, you can go for the hybrid applications like React uh, Native, Ionic, and uh, and the others on the market. I would prefer, in my opinion, if I would have something uh, that's not so heavy on, on hardware, I, I will go for uh, Ionic and Capacitor, in my opinion. It's really easy to use, it's really easy to develop, easy to customize, does the job. But of course, it depends extremely on the nature of the application that you want to develop. Mm -hmm. If if I were to answer this one, well, if I, if I would give a biased answer as a developer, I would really like to get started on some new tech, but that doesn't really go with the business, does it? <laughs> so if it's a completely biased answer, I would like to, to go with Flutter. <laughs> but uh, on a more serious note, um, first of all, I would look at that whatever technology I'm using has a future because we're not building applications for tomorrow, we're building applications for the next few years. So I would check that it, it's backed by the company at least or um, and that it has a, a, a big community behind it and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Which is why, for example, I wouldn't recommend Cordova anymore just because it's a bit shady, uh, the vague what its future is going to be. Other than that, and that's why we try to make the, the table at the end, if you can, if you can pop it back up, please, uh, Grigi. Uh, it's, sort of like, it's sort of like a small, let's say, decision list for you, for you to check what are your needs in your application and pick the best fit. There's no silver bullet for this. So it's specific to what you might need. Yeah. Great, and the third question that we have right now uh, coming from uh, Vlad Simedru. Uh, what do I need to know to be employed as a Flutter junior developer? And he has a second question. Let's, open, let's first answer this one. 
obviously you will need some flood of experience but not necessarily experience in the work field but more like um experience with the language and with the framework as well uh, it's something different as i mentioned it's not swift objective c it's not kotlin java it's not javascript it's dart so you might want to consider doing some tutorials on this one see how the uh, uh, language uh, works experiment with it and then look for jobs that you want to be employed on uh, for the junior uh, role you don't need too much experience so you can just go using uh, this uh, these uh, tips that we just gave you uh, and the second question uh, do we work as a Flutter developer yonder? Uh, well, no, <laughs> but we, we would have wanted to if, with, if we had the opportunity, at least I would have wanted to. Uh, we don't have Flutter at the moment in, in our company. We almost did knows? though. <laughs> Sorry? We almost did one. We almost did though, we almost did, uh, but we don't have it in, uh, in this moment. Maybe in the future, who knows? And, and we, 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 we could take this opportunity uh, just like this, because it's really exciting. Yeah, so. This is strictly an opinionated, let's say, thing. But uh, I personally wouldn't recommend Flutter right now uh, for enterprise solutions. I mean, it's really fun. It's a new thing. It's backed by Google. But uh, again, we're writing code that's supposed to last. And maybe I'm got myself burned to one or once too many times, but I'd rather just go with more mature, stable frameworks rather than jumping on the first new tech as much as the developer in me wants to, it's not responsible. So I wouldn't recommend it right now. That having said that, there are already companies that use it, so. Yeah. Great. Um, th there is one thing that popped in my head though, uh, when, when you mentioned Fuxia, uh, yeah. is, is there a risk of it replacing Android? Of course there is a risk since it has been there on, uh, on the internet, who knows what, what Google decides, uh, since Android is in Google's own housekeeping and Fuxia as well is there. Who knows what decisions will they make in the future? So the risk is all, always there. Um, yeah, they they well, announced. Well, I guess we just this. have to wait and see. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They they said it, it was an experiment to see uh, how how they can have alternatives, but we we we're never sure. Who knows? Okay. Good. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, as Alex said, thank you all for participating to uh, our webinar. Um, Halloween has just passed three days ago, so that means we just went into the uh, festive uh, season. So we wish you all a merry mobile app development. See you in the next one. See you. Hope you enjoyed. Bye.